Aku lupa. Evan.
Hello everybody, good morning. Um, we are here for uh, um, here to introduce you, uh, David Lindo um, Atichati. Uh, he's assistant professor at uh, uh, City University of New York and also associate scientist to the Natural Museum mm -hmm. of uh, Natural Sciences. And um, he has, uh, we have some historical context uh, also through Ananda and his um, PhD advisors, both in, uh, in originally and initially in Las Palmas, mm -hmm. uh, but also then in Miami. And he has been working in uh, an area which is very close to us, uh, mesoscale and sub-mesoscale uh, uh, dynamics, and in particular also with an important element of uh, biological interactions. And so uh, we re-established contact uh, recently, and uh, we thought it was a good opportunity. Uh, he's originally Catalan, but has also some Mallorquinian links. So I think it's good to, to hear what you're doing and to try to, to see uh, ways of uh, working together and advancing together. Excellent. Thank you very much, David, for coming. Thank you for giving. Uh, thank you for the intro and thank you for, for inviting me. So I, I was thinking that maybe I should do that in Spanish because I'm Spaniard and it sounds weird to me to speak in English here in Mallorca, but now I realize that I don't know how to say an Eddie in Spanish, but Molina is kind of weird to me, so I'm going to do it in English if that's okay. So I'm a physical oceanographer. I study the physics of the ocean, uh, mesoscale and some mesoscale eddies, and trying to understand why ocean eddies look the way they do, how they might be changing, and the way they affect uh, the biological and the biogeochemical system in the ocean. So I'm going to give you an overview of my work. If if you have any questions, please stop me and uh, I can reply in less than one minute, I will do so. If you want to go deep into some details of my research, we can discuss that later if you want. But that's an overview of uh, what I've been doing during the past 10 years. So I'm going to take you on a ride from, from New York, Fifth Avenue and 34, where I do my teaching and research, to the places I've been doing my research, basically to the Gulf of Mexico because I did my PhD there at the university, physically at the University of Miami. <coughs> so I'm going to explain you the uh, loop current viability and the effects of the loop current rings on larval fish dispersal and oil dispersal. Then I'm going to take you to the Belizean Barrier Reef. Uh, that was part of my first postdoc at Cui. And we studied, uh, we downscaled several models to study larval dispersal along the Belizean Barrier Reef. Then I'm going to take you to the Hawaiian archipelago where I uh, used some of Ivan's code to detect eddies. And finally to the uh, estuary of Arosa where I'm studying the dispersal of microfibers and emerging contaminants. I would like to show you some work that I'm doing in New York on the bio-proportion of the ocean. This part, last part of my talk is not published, so we are, we are working on understanding how vertical migrations of animals are generating eddies, <coughs> how persistent are these eddies, but again, that's, that final part of my, my talk is, is not published yet, so please bear with me. Um, so in four vignettes, this is my research. I'm going to talk about eddy detection and tracking. Um, I'm going to try to diversify from Ivan's words. I'm going to talk about different stuff. And then I'm going to talk about the interaction between the loop current and bluefin tuna. Then the interaction between the loop current, the anticyclonic ring, and the deep water horizon, uh, oil spill. And then that out-of-the-box idea that we have about biopropulsion of eddies. So, um, I use model and, uh, models and observations to, to study the formation and, and evolution of eddies. 
and also I down uh, I downscale uh, ROMs I downscale ROMs in the South Atlantic Bay to study the evolution of these eddies and the effect on larval dispersal. So here on the right hand side, uh, you have larval fish that are spawned between West Palm Beach and, and the Bahamas, and we also study how these uh, eddies are transporting uh, larval fish. And doing that work with uh, John Gula and, and Mac Williams. So, first of all, I would like to make clear that uh, I think that there are two paradigms of eddies eddies as, a, as an adjective and eddies as a noun. So, <coughs> my education and my, my research is on eddies as a noun, when, where you can consider them. Countable, Lagrangian, the flux is due to a motion of a coherent structure, not to an anom anomaly of, of a fluctuation velocity of the tracer. And, and this is what we are, well, as you know, uh, this way of thinking uh, is usually uh, is using observational physical oceanography and modeling. Whereas there is another way of thinking of eddies as an adjective, where they are uh, an anomalies like uh, Reynolds flux, uh, but this is this is not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about eddies as, as a noun. So um, this is the Gulf of Mexico. When I started my research on, on the low current. Intrusions and vulnerability. I started using satellite SST, but we, we realized that during the bluefin tuna spawning season, which in the Gulf of Mexico is <coughs> end of April and May, uh, there's a lot of cloud contamination, and we couldn't uh, locate and track the mesoscale structures in the Gulf. So, so I used satellite altimetry and and HICOM to, <laughs> to detect and track these eddies and the interactions with Bluefin. And this is one of the images of uh, end of May with cloud contamination. So we developed um, an algorithm to detect eddies, but not only to detect eddies, uh, mesoscale eddies, but to detect the boundaries and core regions of eddies. So basically, we use uh, SSH fields. We calculated the gradient of the Cisopher high field. We overlaid on these fields the SSH contours, and that code is selecting the most, most external contour of these uh, maximum gradient regions. So, for example, this is a weekly field. We map the gradients of SSH and the code is selecting that most external SSH contour. And it's able to detect if this contour is open, as in this case it is, or a closed contour when the anticyclonic ring is detached. So with that very basic um, methodology, we detected all the anticyclonic rings that are detached from the loop current from, from 1993 to 2010. And we created an eddy census of anticyclonic rings. And there are several statistics that we came up with, but maybe one of the most relevant was that starting in 2003, there, there was a turning point, so we see that there are more rings detached from the loop current, that the period of detachment uh, goes from nine months to six months, and also the variability, the standard deviation of these eddy detachments uh, decreased from six months to one month. So, well, as you know, the loop current makes it into the Gulf of Mexico in between Yucatan and, and Cuba, right? And it's Basically, it's an oscillator, and we observed that, that starting in 2003, uh, something was going on. There, were, there are more eddies formed, and the variability has, has decreased. 
Mm, that code not only was useful to detect this anticyclonic, uh, was adapted to that anticyclonic ring in the Gulf of Mexico, but also to to analyze the loop current intrusions into the Gulf. So the code was able to detect that northernmost location of the loop current and the westernmost location of the loop current, that point and that point. Right. And we were able to uh, plot time series of that intrusion. So this is time and this is latitude. This is the time series of the northernmost intrusion into the Gulf of Mexico. And we also observed here that coincidentally starting in 2003, the loop current is more to the north. So the average from May 3 to 2003, the average northernmost location is 26 north. And starting in 2003, the loop current is more to the north. It's about 27 north. And that has a lot of implications for the physical and biological systems. Uh, in the West Florida Shelf. And also the amplitude of these oscillations, north and south, has also been reduced uh, by 1.5, so from 4 degrees north to 2.5 north. And that was sort of a discovery, and we, um, we found some biological correlations with that change in the behavior of the loop curve and, and rings. And so before explaining you the biological implications, I'm going to stick to the physics now. So <clears throat> uh, when I was a, an assistant, when I started my current position, my first grant, so uh, we were funded to study the eddies in the Hawaiian archipelago. So instead of using my old code that I use for the Gulf of Mexico, uh, I reached out to uh, Evan. Uh, and we use the pioneer tracker to study the formation and evolution of eddies uh, in that region of the uh, North, Pacific, North Pacific. So we use a pioneer tracker, and we also downscale an MIT GCM uh, model at four kilometers resolution. And we have a paper with minor reviews about this work that's going to come in the following weeks, I think. So, uh, what we observe uh, using the Bayer tracker on MIT GCM is that there are more both cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies, some mesoscale eddies formed on the leeward of the Hawaiian archipelago. So, these are the main islands here, and there are significantly more cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies uh, around three more times on the leeward side and on, than on the windward side. This is the first spatial uh, analysis that we did. And we also, there's another take home, is that there are more cyclonic eddies than anticyclonic eddies, and that makes sense for that region. But also that the formation is picking up uh, at the end of, in spring, mid-spring to end spring every year. So you see that there are more cyclonic and anticyclonic in April, May, some February uh, each year. And again, I'm going to explain you the biological implication of that in the second part of my talk. Uh, we also map different eddy properties. Uh, that code is it's very nice. So we, we can not only track, detect, and track the eddies, but also we can also map all the eddy properties, such as eddy amplitude, radius, or intensity. And we see different patterns here uh, between cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies in terms of amplitudes. So there is a patch of high amplitude of cyclonic eddies west of Hawaii, and that patch is very much elongated for anticyclonic eddies. These cyclonic eddies are smaller in terms of radius than uh, anticyclonic eddies, which translates into a higher eddy, cyclonic eddy intensity west of Hawaii. Uh, eddy intensity is the 
amplitude divided by the radius. So we have a very high uh, eddy intensity uh, west of Hawaii, and these eddies are pretty static in terms of um, uh, advection of biogeochemical properties. So they are they are staying in that region. And again, I'm going to explain you then the dispersal of larval heat there. Uh, so let's see the implications for the biology of that uh, loop current variability and eddy formation in Hawaii. In Hawaii. So I merged 20 years of satellite altimetry with 20 years of uh, <coughs> larval fish data from NOAA. Southeast Fishery Science Center, and, and we try to correlate both larval spawning of bluefin and, and the physics of the loop current and rings in two regions, in the region of the loop current front and the region of eddies, because dynamically they are very different, so we divided the analysis in these two, in these two regions. And um, we used, again, 20 years of bluefin tuna data. Uh, I'm not a biologist, so please don't ask me too much about that. So, so these are the creatures that we studied. They, these are, we used uh, bluefin younger than 10 days old. We thought at that time that that was a, a, a good cutoff. So 10 days, probably the adults, they are spawning close to the to the collecting sites. Um, I think that was not a good choice. But anyways, so we found that 17% of bluefin are spawning in the loop current region and 83% out of the loop current region. And I guess these two regions are dynamic. So that region of the loop current is changing weekly according to the SSH fields. And that region of eddies is also changing, the shape of the region is changing. Um, so let's analyze first that 17%. So why do we find 17% during 20 years of bluefin tuna uh, in that region of the loop current front? So we plot a uh, time series, that's an annual time series, of the loop current anomalies within that one degree by one degree box. So that means that all these red bars are showing the loop current is more to the north than usual. And the blue bars uh, mean that the loop current is more to the south than usual. So these are again the annual loop current anomalies uh, as using that box as a frame of reference. And these are the average larval concentrations, the annual larval concentrations of bluefin. And what we observe is that the years that the loop current was more to the north than normal, we had higher larval abundances and vice versa. And, and we found that that correlation was, uh, was significant during these 15 uh, years. So basically, uh, what we think is that for some reason, for some biological reason, uh, when the bluefin tuna adult is crossing, is coming from the Atlantic, right, as you know, uh, to the western spawning site, uh, in between the Florida Keys and Cuba, is crossing that, that region of the loop current. And for some reason, it's diving, and the loop current is 800 meters deep. And it's, for some reason, it's triggering some mechanism. And bluefin is spawning right there, right at the boundary, uh, where you have that very high gradient of temperature and, and current speed. That was not that interesting because some of the criticisms, some of the criticisms to that, is that, well, yeah, maybe bluefin is just crossing, diving, crossing that Florida straight stretch, uh, diving, detecting that high gradient and spawning. Or maybe, 
all these benefits that you find correlated with the loop current are actually spun uh, in the southwestern <coughs> Caribbean. So it's 10 days old. So you cannot tell that the roofing is actually spun there. Um, the other uh, distribution of bluefin is 83% and uh, is located in the region of loop current eddies. So we used another eddy detection, I would say, methodology that we developed that is not only detecting eddies, uh, it's not talking about eddy properties at all, it's just detecting eddy, no eddy, but it's also detecting the boundaries of eddies. So for example, if you cross uh, that region and you plot a section there. So the code is on weekly basis for every grid point of the Gulf of Mexico. It's able to detect that grid point and assign that to an anticyclonic region, which is that region, an anticyclonic boundary, which is that region where we have the slope. Common waters, which are this is a fun name. I always have that question, what are common waters? So common waters are basically regions where there is no way detected, or maybe there are some mesoscale areas there, but there is no gradient of SSH. Uh, so it's a region in between features, let's say. Then we have common boundaries, and um, cyclonic boundaries, sorry, cyclonic boundaries and cyclonic regions. And I'm not going to explain you that code. If you want to know more about it, I'm happy to talk about that. But then we merged that to the 20 years of Bluefin Tuna um, data in the region, again, out of the loop current. And what we found is that both positive stations, so where we find Bluefin, and mid-larval densities are significantly higher in anticyclonic boundaries than maybe in any other region. And, and this, um, yeah, and these uh, differences are, are significant. So not only in the loop current, bluefin is spawning uh, across that boundary, which makes some sense, but also out of the loop current, bluefin is spawning at the boundaries or close to the boundaries. Or uh, larval fish in these 10 days are advected coincidentally to the boundaries of anticyclonic regions only. Um, so as you can see, there's a huge difference between the boundaries of cyclonic and anticyclonic areas there. Um, so we use that product of any detection, an any detection algorithm and that result uh, with all the previous words from Bart Mullin, who was my PhD advisor, to, to create an operational product for NOAA, Southeast Fisheries Science Center. So that product basically is, is using, to get the mystery out of it, is using uh, that knowledge of bluefin spawning at the boundaries and the SST habitat of bluefin tuna knowledge basically to predict where are we going to find bluefin. So here, um, as you can imagine, that's an index that goes from 0 to 1. What is the highest chance to find in bluefin? We went to the field in 2015 and 2016. And we found bluefin. So these are the positive locations in red and the negative in blue. And we found bluefin where we were predicting. So that was uh, that was great, 2015 and 16. And we said, well, we did a great job. We published three papers about that in MEPS and Fisheries Oceanography. Uh, however, in 2017, I was invited, I think, at the end of the year, I was invited uh, by the Spaniards to participate in an IEO uh, project in Malaga. Uh, that NOAA Ecolatum project. And that was, a, long story short, an intercomparison project to compare both spawning sites, the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Mexico one. And I did a, a backtracking exercise <coughs> in the Gulf of Mexico. And I hope that works. Oh, 
that's the result. So all that. <laughs> so okay. So we backtrack bluefin tuna, thousand bluefin tunas from the actual collecting site. Ten days backwards to the spawning site, right? In the western Gulf of Mexico and in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And as you can see while I'm talking, these guys are moving from again, this is counterintuitive, so this is from collecting to spawning back in time. And they move quite a lot. And what we observe is that, for example, there's a lot of info here, but we, let's focus on the western, in the western Gulf of Mexico, that region of Eris, out of the loop current. Uh, the average maximum distance that they cover in, in 10 days is 70 kilometers. Um, the SST and system facility are similar at spawning and collecting sites. But in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, near the blue current, near the frontal areas that are uh, moving along the loop current, the average maximum distance of this bluefin baby fish are 110 k's. Uh, the SST at spawning is 1.5 Celsius higher than the temperature at collecting. And the sea surface salinity is 0.4 PSU fresher than at collecting. And the eddy features are totally different. Not in the western, but in the eastern, the eddy features are totally different. So uh, that, was, that was me like one year ago. So that's forcing us to rethink that MEPS paper, that fishery oceanography paper, because during these 10 days, baby fish, they move quite a lot. So we cannot say in all these papers that the oceanographic conditions in general at spawning and collecting are the same. Um, are you following me? Yes, right. um, yeah, and this is just a map showing showing that these differences. These are the actual collecting sites. Um, these spaghetti plots are are showing where they're coming from, and some of them are are actually spawned uh, down here uh, east of Yucatan. So. On the larval dispersal uh, project, uh, so we we obtain an NSF. Uh, it's a one million NSF to answer that very basic and fundamental, but still unresolved question: How far do baby fish go from their parents? Uh, believe it or not, or at least NSF thought that 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 question was not solved. So. Basically, it's how far do coral reef fish go from this natal source, source to the destination site. Um, why did we ask that question on this person? So, at that time, in the second largest barrier reef, uh, the Mesoamerican barrier reef, we thought that uh, all the literature was showing that baby fish disperse on the order of 90 to 100 kilometers from the spawning uh, site. And marine protected areas and PAs in that region, um, so that's Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico, right, were designed in that region according to that dispersal kernel. So this is a dispersal kernel showing distance and settling probability. So the probability to settle um, after they disperse. Um, so again, that was the the field was showing us that, that they disperse uh, 90 to 100 k. Okay. So we were again we were funded by NSF to show if that was true or not. So we downscale uh, a high com model and a very high resolution, one kilometer. Um, horizontal resolution, 30 vertical layers. We force that uh, high con model with a wolf uh, model at one kilometer resolution, and that's, that's very high. 
So that region. And we went to the field and we deployed drifters. Uh, we deployed 55 drifters in, with the aim to actually validate that model. So, so yeah, so this is the study side, this is Caribou Key. Uh, as you can see, that's a, that's a huge island that you can go around in uh, like five minutes. And, and we deploy uh, we deployed uh, clusters of drifters, couples of drifters, and we recover them. So, all right. So what we did with that exercise again is to validate the model, but not only that, we compare that with other different models. So basically, we downscale. Uh, three different models and we use the existing model there. So Lola stands for, or Lola, since I'm in Spain I can say Lola. So Lola <laughs> stands for low ocean and low atmospheric resolution. Uh, Ola stands for high ocean and low atmospheric resolution. Then we increase both the resolution of the ocean model and the atmospheric model. That's the 1K HICOM and 1K WARF. And then we turn on the, the channels for that model. And this is all the information that I just said, if you want to know more about that. Also, the temporal resolution of these models increased. So that LOLA has daily resolution, and the atmospheric forcing is 25 kilometers, so it's very close. And these other models, they have 1K atmospheric resolution again, and the temporal resolution is one hour. Um, okay, so we validate the <coughs> zonal velocity, the meridional velocity, and the relative dispersal. Uh, so we compare in that. So we compare the speed of the flow and the speed of real and virtual drifters, and also the relative dispersal of the real drifters. And the relative dispersals of virtual drifters that we that we deployed with a Lagrangian model. All right. So these box plots box plots are showing us the anomalies in the u velocity, v velocity, and relative dispersal. So on the um, u anomalies, on the zonal anomalies. We observe that there are no significant differences in the prediction of use when we increase the resolution from um, eight kilometers in the ocean model to one kilometer. So in that region, in that specific region, um, it doesn't. We don't really need to go that that high and to spend 50k on a passport to do that. However, the atmospheric uh, model matters. So when we increase the atmospheric resolution from 25K to 1K, and from daily to hourly, uh, there is a significant improvement in the prediction of use, also in the prediction of this. And regarding the, we can talk more about that if I mean, there's a lot of messages there, but I think that I'm going to keep that below. Uh, also, in the relative dispersal, the black line is the actual relative dispersal of real drifters, the actual separation of real drifters. So basically, after three hours, they just uh, kick off, they, they just start to separate. And the Lola model does a pretty bad job after one hour diverse from reality, but the other three models, and especially Hoha T with tides, is following during this initial four hours, is actually following the dispersal of drifting, and is doing a pretty good job. So in the take-home messages are that atmospheric resolution matters for that region, and, and also including tides, it's, it's very important. So, so then we 
use the optimal model, that whole hard T, and the connectivity modeling system, which is one, just simply a, another Lagrangian uh, scheme to, to move baby fish or rodents or anything, right? And we dispersed baby fish with no vertical migration, ontogenetic vertical migration, and with vertical migration, so these baby fish, they have some behavior in the model, so we can allow them to, to migrate, right? And, and we go to go with the surface currents and to the 50 meters currents. And what we found is that most of these baby fish, yeah, so there is a sharp decrease, most of them, they go from their parents, they go 10 kilometers. And as you can remember from that previous dispersal kernel plot, yeah. <clears throat> And uh, we went from 90 kilometers, so that plot was showing that that minimum was basically here at 90 kilometers. But we see that with that optimal model that is validated, that uh, minimum is at 10k. Um, so there was another postdoc from Pui also working there. She's a biologist. While I was deploying drifters and just getting crispy uh, on board, she was typing. And she did some parental analysis on the baby fish and the adults. So basically, she built uh, a real, not a model, uh, dispersal kernel. And what she found, and that's published in PNAS, what she found is that the maximum dispersal kernel in that region is 10 kilometers. So, on the one hand, this is, again, validating that one of these models. And on the other hand, this is changing the field in the, in the region. So, so, we are going to, we need to rethink the MPAs uh, in order to consider this 10K instead of 9K of this person. And or less, I'm gonna just keep that one because that's probably, that's a lot. All right, so I did the same exercise of dispersal uh, of baby fish in the Hawaiian archipelago. And this is the main island from, of Hawaii. And this is the dispersal of a thousand baby fish in a linear eddy. And this is the dispersal of a thousand baby fish uh, in a non-linear area. So what we see is that, and that's a new take home, that consistently in that region, uh, non-linear areas, especially cyclonic, do you remember that patch of high eddy activity, cyclonic eddy activity? Non-linear areas are, are favoring retention of baby fish in, in the region. Not only cyclonic, but non-linear. And it's where the propagation speed is lower than the swirl speed. Um, any questions there? I'm just going to move to the oil. I'm going to leave the fish. OK. All right, so I'm going to change gears. Um, I promise that's going to be faster. Um, so. I got a phone call from a friend of mine, and he said, um, you have to get involved in this spill. What is it? You what have to get in the game and get down here. So, the first thing was... That's a summary of... I got a phone call from a friend of mine, and he said, um, you have to get involved in this spill. You have to get in the game and get down it. The Deepwater Horizon event was the first oil spill in which they actually went down with a submarine and injected uh, dispersant into the, into the oil that was coming out of the earth. The public was unsatisfied with the concept that the dispersant was just gone. And you could see these big tankers filled with this stuff being dumped in the ocean, and how could it just disappear and nobody know where it went? Okay. Uh, now, 
from Spain that looks like a Hollywood movie now. I see that picture. <laughs> 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 I, know. I know how you feel. <laughs> All right, so uh, I received a phone call, not from a friend of mine, but from my PhD in Miami, uh, Gustavo Goni, the physical ethnographer. Uh, and he said, you got to get involved in the game, so you cannot go to Spain in summer, so you have to stay here and work with us. So uh, we developed a Lagrangian modeling tool. So we adapted one of these uh, Lagrangian models the CMS, Connectivity Modeling System, to OIL. So basically that Lagrangian model is uh, affecting parcels of water, right, with some chemical behavior. I'm a chemical oceanographer. Uh, so the advection of a, par uh, a parcel, a water parcel, at each time step, is calculated using the previous position, of course, and also integrating uh, the velocity field and added that adding that behavior. So the behaviors that we model for each water parcel with oil, it's uh, diffusion, um, dissolution. So we drop droplets, right, of oil with some diameter, and this the droplet size was uh, changing with time. So Oil droplets were shrinking, and where they get to the surface, they are able to evaporate, and they are also biodegrading. So we include uh, uh, different equations of biodegradation and dissolution. Right. Okay, so. So the nature of the plume, uh, basically, there are two types of plumes, and, uh, a cross-slope plume and a stratified plume. The Deepwater Horizon was a mixture of a cross-slope and stratified plume. So we have the wellhead at 1,500 meters. And 300 meters above that wellhead, 1,200 meters, we had oil and gas separating, so the oil is the black and gas is these white droplets. So oil and gas were actually separating and it's like the oil was exiting the elevators of different depths. Um, so that's the theory and some uh, lab experiments. With that model that I briefly explained before, we were able to replicate a, a virtual uh, stratified plume with a low stratification and a plume with a very high stratification and, and we were able to observe how when we have a very high stratification in the water column uh, you have that exit of the elevator at different depths exit of oil um, so with that, with that model, uh, my postdoc advisor, Harris, uh, and, and others, we published that paper on the evolution of droplet size in the deep water horizon oil spill. So what this animation is showing you is the evolution of different droplet sizes from 0 to 200 microns. And as you could see, I'm going to just play that one more time. They are red droplets, droplets larger than 150 microns. They go to the surface right away. But droplets smaller than 60 microns, they stay like that. So on that paper, uh, we were able to observe where is the cutoff of droplet size. So just by buoyancy, right? When droplets are shrinking, when they are smaller, than 50 microns, they stay up there and they form that deep plume that was also observed. So that's okay. So, as I said before, we include included several chemical behaviors of oil, and we did several sensitivity analyses 
And out of all these behaviors, we found that biodegradation of oil matters. So uh, we had some collaborators in Germany who did some experiments of biodegradation with the bacteria that is found in the Gulf of Mexico at different depths, so at different pressures, right? At 150 bars, which is the pressure that we have at the wellhead. And we included that biodegradation of oil into the model. So we deployed uh, thousands of particles uh, every day and followed them for 90 days. And we were able to map the evolution of the, the pancake, the big pancake. That, that's fun. When I talk about that in the US, that's all. But now it's like big pancake. <laughs> so the, so as, as I explained before, right, the oil exits the elevator at different depths. And it forms kind of a pancake. Right. Pues, uh, that deep pancake that was uh, about 40 kilometers uh, diameter, we were able to, to map and to track the center of mass of that deep pancake and map the evolution of the mean center of mass of that pancake. And we observed with that model that is including biodegradation, so let's focus on the green line the high pressure biodegradation experiment, that the average depth of that tank grows from 1,200 meters to 1,100 meters in three months. So that deep tank, that deep plume of small droplet sizes was staying there at depth uh, for three months. And we went to the field and from CTD cast, uh, we map also at different locations of that pancake, right? We did some cast. And using fluorometry, we were able to detect where oil signals were. And that model was doing a pretty good job at detecting the average depth of the pancake. So this is the maximum error that we found, which is about 50 meters. And this is the minimum error that we found between the predicted oil, depth of the oil, and the observed depth of the oil. And that's about 10 to 15 meters. Um, and that was, that, was a, that was a great project. Uh, now if, I'm gonna wrap up here. So do I have five more minutes or come on? No, no, two, two minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think that. Say, <laughs> still we are. Because this is also contaminants. This is a paper published in Environmental Science and Technology. We can go over this. Basically, it's the same stuff. I'm very excited about this one. If I have two minutes, I will focus on this one. So I'm working with John Davier at Stanford uh, on that idea of biogenic mixing of the ocean. So diurnal vertical migrations, 10 to 100 meters vertically. So are they actually, so don't call me on that, right? But I have to go back. Are they actually mixing the ocean? So what are the length scales of the eddies that are formed? Now I'm going to the microstructure, right? So what are the length scales of the eddies that are formed uh, when these creatures are vertically migrating twice a day? And we did some experiments, and John did some experiments. If you go to the, to the size of the individual, the mixing efficiency is 10, it's very low. So imagine that you dump 10 vats into the ocean. Imagine that you have a cup with coffee or milk, right? And you mix it with a spoon, right? So the mixing, mixing efficiency is, is high. But we don't have individuals that large, right? So now imagine that the spoon is one micron instead of one centimeter, one micron. So if you steer with a spoon of one micron, you're not going to mix the coffee. But what if we have a community of individuals? What if we have 1,000 spoons of one micron, right? So what John is doing in his lab and what I'm doing in my lab, uh, I have a tank at Columbia University where we are forcing uh, grassroot to move vertically. And we are measuring the eddies that are for 
this is uh, this is so exciting. So we are measuring so these like cometas, right, are the the animals, but we are also measuring the eddies uh, that are formed. And what we are finding is that these eddies are are ten times larger than the community, than the whole community, not the individual, than the whole community, and they are persistent. So we are trying to measure that in the lab. And these two gyres are. And with that, uh, I would like to thank the funding, my students, and, and you guys. Thank you very much. I'm sorry because I, I, I put a lot of info on that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We have time for uh, a couple of questions. Well, I have a question. Yeah, I'm a microbiologist. I have no idea on physics. And, and, but I was wondering about your study on the oil steel, for example. Yeah. And so I guess that uh, the different plumes are different composition also in, chemis in the chemistry of the oil because yes. they might stratify different yes. sizes, right. composition, uh, solubility. Yes. So, and this will have an implication on the biodegradation. So probably the lighter will be much easier degraded than exactly. the very So is this all integrated in your uh, model? No, this is, a very, this is not integrated. So, so we use the heavy oil Right? and the biodegradation on that heavy oil. But then, how that oil was changing, and the biodegradation mm -hmm. is changing also on different lighter fractions of the, of the oil, we didn't include that. So it's like our oil had the same, uh, was this, had the same composition through time, and then therefore the same biodegradation, although that's not quite right. You're right. Mm. No, because it depends. It's not yes. the same whether you have aliphatic and aromatic yes. carbons. And yes. Carbon. Yes. So our oil is the same during the ninety days. The properties, not the droplet property, but the actual chemical composition is the same. Yeah, but you have oxygen, so the oxygen is also yes. modifying the con so. Yeah, no, no, that's that's a very good point. Yes, that's right. I have another question. So. Also, I was thinking, well, this is a very nice, neat thing on the fishes, but um, coral bleaching could be also a good model to, to check for this, because uh, you should have patterns on coral bleaching, if mm -hmm. really the, the waters are carrying, for example, the pathogens for coral bleaching. That's right, yeah. yeah. And this region is uh, probably a good model for this. Yeah, that's something that we, we have the model there, and but it can be used also for, yes. Mm -hmm. So how the pattern of that meandering flow in mm. east of uh, Belize can also be... And, and these biologists that they do all this uh, genetic analysis and now they with this uh, technology that we have on um, what we call metagenomics, which is just sequencing everything that is out yeah. there, you could also very cheaply uh, check for the biological movement of the different communities of, that you have. And you oh. can check whether this uh, genetics are actually really driven by the waters or not. Yeah, so this yeah. yeah, there is a follow-up project on that. So they are studying the, the change in the genetic structure of the community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we are using data from in that region, three years from the Smithsonian, three years of the genetic structure and how, and yeah, merging that with the model. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you have more uh, rings uh, after in the loop current that developed in 2000 after the 2003. Yes. Uh, did you find any correlation regarding the size of the eddies that they are detached? Because you saw also fluctuation in the latitude. Yeah. So it, it, it really depends. This 100 kilometers that you have, how big also is the ring that detached? from the car. Yes, that's yeah. we didn't explore the size of the of the ring, so how the because that code is it's not actually given the edit properties. But yeah, I don't remember if there is a change in the size. Starting in 2003, we published another paper with Pablo Sangra uh, on the effect of, of the wind stress on the formation of 
on that change, on that shift in 2003. And we found some correlation on the wind stress, changes in wind stress around these years in that region, and the uh, eddy detachment, but, but not the size, yeah. But that's something that we should explore, yes. Maybe that. Maybe yeah, exactly. a question. <laughs> uh, did you find any relationship uh, between uh, the different climatic uh, indexes that you could have in the region in the time series that you, you saw? No, we didn't explore that. Climatic indexes, no. Uh, no, as I said, we just tried to do an exercise to merge, that, merge it with the change in the wind stress field. But we couldn't correlate that with the changes in the AM, AM or any other climate index, no. But, but I'm happy to do that if, if you are interested. <laughs> yes. And so you show in, um, that your oil droplets are affected by Lagrangian, classical Lagrangian code, yes. and you add a term for the behavior of this yes. person. And do this term include some kind of uh, interaction between the particles or everything? No. No, that's a okay. yeah. So these particles they they stick together and, yes, and, they, and they stick to the bathymetry. So well, uh, we include the interaction between the particles and the bathymetry. So when they interact with the bathymetry, they stop there, they die. But no interaction between the droplets, and they can they can collapse. Yes, and they can increase the size again. But but no. And also, we didn't include any marine snow. Uh, which is also changing the droplet size. But it takes a lot of work to be done there. Yes, it's not so sophisticated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then. Say it, like. Es, sí, o sea, no es, no es lógico en el North Pacific, hay más anticiclones que ciclones, pero en esa zona, eh, sí, en esa zona, justo en el leeward side de Hawái, hay más ciclones que anticiclones por el wind shear. Si mapeas el wind shear, uh -huh. ¿sí? eh, hay un mapa, después si quieres te lo muestro, eh, hay un mapa del wind shear y tiene sentido que por el wind shear que hay en, entre las dos, entre la main island de Hawái y, y la que está al norte, que se formen eh, ciclones. Por la, por la estructura vertical del wind shear, se forman más ciclones que anticiclones en esa... No en el, en el North Pacific en general, que sería el viceversa, pero en esa zona, en el oeste de Hawái. Sí, 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 el viento. Sí. Sí. O sea, por el tamaño de la isla de Hawái, por la altura y por la menos altura de las demás, ese wind shear hace que se formen ciclones. Sí, se forman también anticiclones, pero el más grande, digamos, eh, sí que luego te muestro el mapa, pero el más grande que se forma por ese wind shear, entre el estrecho entre las dos islas, es un ciclón. Y después sí que se forman más anticiclones alrededor, a los otros dos lados. Sí. sí. Biokinematics might actually close the, 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 the large scale ocean energy balance and so on and so forth. But I think in the end, the, the argument of one out was that it somehow to do with internal waves and so on and so forth, but the balance of it. Um, but I remember at the time the difficulty was that it was clear that these things were putting a lot of energy in, or at least that they, they, were, they, were, they, they were compelling themselves very efficiently, um, and therefore you've got, to have a, you've got to have a reaction to that. Right. The problem is, of course, it, it, nothing seemed to align or coalesce in any kind of um, coherence or anything. So the fact that the feeling was it was uh, it just, just creating a huge um, entropy, um, uh, uh, ent entropy set, high ent entropy state and right. actually putting things together that way. But I do know a lot of people were working on um, uh, exactly how they, how, they, how they do it. These things actually know all about Richardson number and so on. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. fronds that they fold down with their feeding so they can bring food to their mouth and not Move away. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, these frogs come out, and suddenly now they can move very, very fast. Right. Um, but are you taking this further? I think I, I still felt there was an awful lot of interesting work there to be done. Uh, that last work, right? Yeah. So. What are your plans? So, my, our plans is to not to study 
course, if you study the individual, <coughs> the mixing efficiency, it's it's extremely low. It's uh, when. Uh, sorry. <coughs> yeah. So at the scale of the individual, the mixing efficiency efficiency is uh, it's one percent, the, the maximum at the scale of the individual. But our plan is to deploy uh, hundreds of them and to study the the mixing efficiency of the community, not not only one. I don't know if I'm answering your question. I, I'm uh, yeah, sort of. Because what, because what I mean, presumably what you're trying to do there is to work out whether there's any coherence to the to the yeah. they're putting in the system. Yeah, yeah. But not not the scale of the individual. The, the, the efficiency is, is again one percent at the maximum. Uh, length scale of the individual is the efficiency of the community and, and of course we are using a tank of two meters and there are some limitations there and we are going to receive a lot of heat on that but that's what we can do I think that I think that we need to measure how how is that mixing the upper layer but I'm, I'm, I, I didn't know about that proposal 40 years ago if you can share that it's about 15 or 20 years. Ah, 15, okay. 15. Sorry. Uh, it's very famous, so we've got the time. I'll look it up for you. Okay, <laughs> cool, thanks. Um, eh, dos, dos comentarios. Uno es que el, eh, ahora mismo la Comisión Internacional de Atún Rojo está cambiando todo el modelo, toda la forma en que se hace la asesoría. Uh -huh. Y están implementando en malas en este sentido. Y ahora mismo, esto fue la semana pasada, eh, se ha visto que. Eh, que lo que más se está cortando los modelos son los índices de rebaños uh -huh. que genera la norma sí. y que generamos aquí. Vale. Entonces, eh, el índice de rebaño de la norma lo genera Walter Inga. Sí, sí, lo conozco. Y, y se ha visto que, o sea, todo esto que has mostrado de cómo eh, la luz corre en, en una serie de años en que entra más o menos, uh -huh. eh, está, determina mucho cuál es la distribución de los hábitats de rebaños. Sí. Y nosotros, a nosotros nos pasa un poco lo mismo. Empezamos a hablar de hábitats de cuesta ¿Eh? y acabamos hablando de hábitats de la playa. Claro. Son dos cosas diferentes, son más importantes. Claro. Y, sí, sí, y, sí. Y sí, sí. A, a diferenciar, ¿no? Pero esos hábitats de la playa están determinando muchísimo la, la capturabilidad en el muestreo sistemático. ¿Ah? Pues creo que sería muy interesante eh, intentar mejorar las estandarizaciones que hace la NOA, que hace Walter con las probabilidades que, que, que tú puedes generar en, en, con estos análisis. Claro. Sí. Porque podrían mejorar mucho el, la salida la, la, en el análisis de abnumacias que se están utilizando para todo el Claro, claro. Un... Pues son muy diferentes lo que, los índices que saca Walter que los que sacáis vosotros. No, no tiene nada que ver. No tiene nada que ver. Claro. Los estos diferentes. Claro. Pero lo, lo interesante es ver. Eh, a ver cómo integrar la, la variabilidad del hábitat larga en el récord métrico mejoraría la, 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 la capacidad de, de analizar la abundancia claro, claro. que está muy condicionada por, por que estés pescando en el hábitat récord. Claro, sí, sí, sí. Eh, sería, sería, creo que sería muy interesante. Sí, 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 sí. lo hablamos. Sí, sí. Y el otro comentario es, eh, los análisis que hacéis cuando hacéis eh, high resolution en zonas costeras, eh, para la distribución de largas en, en la chiquera, ¿no? esto es con eh, passive tracking, o sea, son pa eh, partículas pasivas. Eh, no, en este no, en este le ponemos, eh, le ponemos mortalidad de datos de los biólogos del grupo y le ponemos eh, migraciones verticales. Sí, y de los comportamientos biológicos eh, también le ponemos cosas que están muy de moda como orientation to cues. Que cuando se acercan al reef, lo, como que lo ven, se orientan un poco y empiezan a nadar. Pero creemos que lo que más, de esos behaviors que ponemos en el modelo, la migración vertical es lo que más afecta. Porque bueno, si lo piensas, claro, bajan las velocidades eh, horizontales eh, bastante. ¿no? Entonces... No, creo que es una línea muy interesante de, para mí todo lo que es eh, la tecnología en el sur de la escala con, con tecnología. ¿no? Sí, sí, sí. Eh, los noruegos hicieron algunos trabajos interesantes cómo la sensibilidad, cuál era la sensibilidad respecto a tu conocimiento de la especie. Ajá. Hacían 
Exactamente. Sería muy interesante también hacer algo en temas de cómo, cómo, cómo de sensibles son los sectores finales a conocer mejor cuál es el patrón de migración. Claro. Sí, eso sería, además sería fácil hacer un análisis de sensibilidad. Eso sí. sí, sí, no, lo hablamos. <risa> Súper. Ok, sí. pues muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a vosotros. Gracias. Gracias.